Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you again to the third year of our local history program. And uh, tonight I have St. Thomas's most prominent military historian, a very young man to be such a brilliant historian. He's also <clears throat> really the godfather of the 91st Battalion. He's looked after them. His name is Lieutenant Brian Sims of the Elgin Regiment. And Brian, I'd like to welcome you to the program. Thank you very much, George. And he has uh, <coughs> Lance Corporal Jerry Cook with him, who's going to run the slide machine later on, plus half a dozen other people here who are on the cameras. Uh, two years ago, Brian, we did a uh, two series uh, on military history, starting from the very beginning, the War of 1812. Right. And uh, what I'd like to do this evening is uh, start a little later than 1812, not cover that ground. But first, I have a couple of personal questions I'd like to ask you. I noticed that you've been recommended as one of the four nominees for the St. Thomas Young Man of the Year Award uh, because of all the work you've done in uh, collecting military history and in uh, working with the few members who are left of the 91st Battalion and in assessing the history of the 91st Battalion. And I'd like to congratulate you for being nominated for that. Thank you. I appreciate it's that. It's quite George. an honor. I think I, I hope you win. I don't get a vote or I'd vote for you. Thank you. Um, well, what uh, has happened in the last few years is that the Elgin Regiment has decided to try and put together a history of the regiment. Now, yes. could you tell us something about that? Uh, basically, the, um, it, it started really, I guess, three or four years ago. I came on with a regiment about two years ago uh, and transferred from Number 7 Cadet Corps. But prior to that, uh, Colonel Warren, the commanding officer of the regiment, uh, had uh, instructed the uh, regimental historian, who was uh, Lieutenant, now Captain, Len Kirchen, to prepare a manuscript and, in fact, to write the regimental history. And he said to Len that uh, if you write the history, I'll assure you that it will get published. And after that time, shortly after, Len completed his task and uh, had to leave because of personal commitments. He now lives in Ottawa, still very active in the military, and, uh, but has got somewhat out of the book for a short time, but most interested. I was tasked to carry it on from then on, and uh, because of the numerous photographs I had in my collection, uh, we decided to insert those. We've made some amendments, minor amendments, We've added a considerable number of nominal roles, which I think will be interesting to everyone. Find the grandfathers and great-grandfathers. And what is the title of this book going to be? The Elgins. And uh, the author will be Leonard Kirchen, and then you have supplied all the... Uh, it's co-authored. Co-authored. The book itself is co-authored, yes. Because uh, Mr. Kerr, Captain Kirchen used a lot of your material that you'd collected, and... Uh, yeah, Len and I worked together uh, prior to my entering the scene as far as the regiment is concerned. Now, when is this book going degree. to be published? Hopefully. We're in the process of the final negotiations now with uh, a local printer, Sutherland Press, uh, who is taking care of all of the printing requirements. We've actually done the publishing ourselves at the regiment. And uh, it should be out in late November, early December. Make an ideal so, Christmas present. Sutherland Press, you're now committed. <laughs> uh, well, how, uh, how many copies are you publishing of this? At, we're 1,000 copies, 700 of which will be a standard edition, and 300 which will be uh, numbered, specially numbered. They'll have a page in them there, in fact, called a collector's edition. Yeah. So I guarantee you've got a first edition. Uh -huh. Well, uh, I think, you know, I, I'm sure you'll sell a lot more than 1,000. I'm sorry they're putting it out in such a limited edition, really, although it's always a gamble. What does it cost you, roughly, to put that out? Uh, we will have invested, uh, estimate right now, of course we haven't finalized the contract, but we'll have over $13,000 into it uh, when we're completed. And at the end of the sales, uh, people have seen the advertised price with our costs for the photographs and that, reproducing photographs uh, and just the time for staff typists and that, we will vir virtually break even and the profit that is made immediately goes into the Elgin Regiment Museum Fund. Oh, yeah. So it That's a, another a project. second task. You won't yeah. say anything about tonight, but the yeah. Elgin Museum are trying to, or the Elgin Regiment is trying to establish a kind of military museum in conjunction with our local Pioneer Museum. Yes. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> um, what's this book going to sell for? 
As I said, there are two types of copies. The standard edition is $14.75, and the collector's edition, at a very good price, I see now, of $16.75. But unfortunately, I'd like to tell all of your viewers that most of the numbered copies are already committed. They, in fact, have been sold. Pre-sales have virtually taken them all. So, but there's still uh, lots of others. Oh, yes. And who do they get in touch with if they want to buy them? If they contact either myself at home, I'll be more than happy to accept their order over the phone, or the orderly room at the Elgin Regiment. Yeah. And they're, the staff there is prepared to assist in any way. So it's Brian Sim, S-I-M, and uh, he lives out in Lyndhurst, and, or the orderly room of the Elgin Regiment. Now let's get back. We're, um, the genesis of the Elgin Regiment uh, goes a long way back, and it really goes back to uh, two local sort of organizations we had in uh, Elgin County. Yes. The St. Thomas uh, Volunteer Rifles yes. and uh, the St. Thomas Cavalry. Yes. Now, would you like to say something about the rifles? Well, the rifle company, <laughs> again, if we go back just a little bit farther, at the time, the militia was a necessity in the area. Uh, at still. Um, the activity and the, the destruction that had taken place in the area during the War of 1812 was still strongly felt by many of the members in the community, and so active rifle associations were throughout the area, and Iona, Fingal, St. Thomas, Vienna, Tilsonburg, Port Stanley, to simply to protect the communities. Still at that time, uh, there was real no major threat as far as anyone was concerned, possibly from the U.S., as we'll see later. But the St. Thomas Troop of, uh, St. Thomas Volunteer um, Company of Rifles came into existence in 1857. And the Troop of Cavalry really came into existence prior uh, to the Mackenzie Rebellion. In fact, we're... In 1837. Yes, in 36, when, uh, seven, young Irma Tinger uh, yes. raised a troop beer and yes. went down and charged across the ice of Pelee Island. Right. And that was where our first casualty, you know, as right. far as a military exercise. Well, they have some in 1812, of course. As in, in Elgin County, from what we can see, we can't, I haven't been able to find it now. There must have been some men because Brock, when he stopped here on his way to Fort Detroit, or stopped the course of Fort Stanley on his way to Fort Detroit, um, picked up many men from the area, many recruits, uh, one of them being a Captain Metcalf. He's one of the few that I've actually been able to find on the nominal roles uh, who were awarded for their services in some way, shape, or form. But well, that must Captain have been Metcalf me. is uh, uh, the ancestor of uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Harry Metcalf of St. Thomas. I think he's an ancestor of uh, him, and then he went back to Toronto, and yes. then uh, uh, Harry's father came here. So and there's a connection. Now. He is related to Lieutenant yes. Colonel Metcalf. And Colonel Metcalf has in his possession um, the Military General Service Medal for 1793-1814 with the bar for Detroit to his. That's the famous capture of Detroit when Brock uh, Buffalo what, Hull yes. and uh, made him surrender the fort of Detroit with a very a few cannon force. shots and yeah. some war hoops from the... Well then, the, the War of 1812 left a bad taste in everybody's mind and yes. uh, the this area was looted several times by MacArthur Very and Marauding severely. Brands right. from the state, so they had a kind of local militia formed. And it only met, though, about once a year, didn't it? Yes. Had a drill, and it was kind of a joke. Uh, it met, and in fact, it, it was stopped by a local group of wives, because in fact, what it turned out to be is instead of one day, it turned out to be three, four, five days. It's reported as that, and several of the men came home looking like they'd been through a war. Yeah, but they'd actually been <laughs> just drinking a little too yes, much. Yes, yes. Right. Not too much drill. Well then, um, uh, in the 1860s, when the uh, militia changed here, and when we had the St. Thomas Volunteers and the St. Thomas Cavalry, mm -hmm. uh, in the back of everybody's mind was a growing agitation in the states, led yes. by the Irishmen, who felt that uh, Britain was responsible for all troubles that Ireland had ever had, and who yes. carried their hatred with them to the states, and who formed an organization called the Fenians. Yes, the Fenian Brotherhood. I yes, believe. and their aim was to invade Canada and free it from the hated British rule and an exit to the United States. Yes. And they were uh, uh, 
they weren't actively supported by the American government, but the American government did shut their eyes to their activities, didn't yes, they? Yes, for quite some time. Uh, yeah. Of course, when they came over in the spring of 66, they were, it's, uh, they'd come about basically from the aftermath of the American Civil War. You, in fact, did have experienced troops to a degree. They were well armed. They had a lot of money. Um, they were completely open about what they were going to do. They had uh, open meetings in New York City. They advertised. Um, they uh, promised all of the people who were involved. They had grants of land already cut up. They'd already cut Canada up and were going to give it to the people. They promised it to the people involved. Well, we had lots of empty land at that time, so if they had taken us, they'd have been able to give all their, their Irish uh, volunteers some land. Yes. But anyway, uh, in 1866, the invasion did come. Yes. I'd like to say a little bit about that. Well, they are in, in the area. In 66, we had s several companies ready in, in the area. There was the Vienna, the St. Thomas, the Port Stanley Marine Company. Yes. Tilsonburg Infantry, which was part of Elgin at that time, and considered part of the 25th Elgin Battalion of Infantry, was Iona, Fingal, uh, which had a mounted infantry battalion, which, when you think about it, was convenient um, for the times. It was the only practical type of force, uh, especially for the logistics of the area. They were probably going to come across, either across the lake or either the Sarnia or Niagara frontier, which they did. When they came across, uh, at Sarnia, or in the sandwich area on that, uh, we had the uh, Port Stanley Marine Company went down with Shanley's Battery, a London Field Battery from London, and defended the borders in that area. They did not, in fact, were never involved in an engagement, as were none of the members of the Elgins at that time, unfortunately. Well, where did the St. Thomas Rifles go? St. Thomas Rifles stayed in the area. They stayed on... Um, they supported garrison duty in London at that time, and they were involved protecting the frontier and the shoreline, as were the but troop of cavalry. Weren't they, uh, didn't the St. Thomas volunteers, there were about three weeks in London, and they were in London in that, uh, I guess, was it May when uh, yes. uh, Port Stanley thought there was an invasion coming yes. in, and they rushed them all from London down to Port Stanley by the old LMPS that right. had only been built a few years before. And uh, they stayed there that night with the Port Stanley Marines. One night, that's right. Yeah, and then they went back to London. But then I thought they spent four weeks at Sarnia after that. They were, uh, almost all of the companies, including Van and Tilsenberg, served some time at Sarnia. Yeah. But during the main act, Fenian activity in the spring, it was, it was mainly the, um, who stayed on was the Port Stanley Marines. Well, then the St. Thomas Cavalry, uh, was responsible for the district from uh, Port Stanley down to uh, uh, Eagle and yes, Dutton and, and places like that. You'll see Port Glasgow yes, Port and Glasgow. Port Burwell. Many of those mentioned yeah. in, the, in the original nominal roles for that particular period. It was kind of an exciting time because uh, what the, uh, uh, a lot of American boats uh, would uh, stop out in the lake and would send a rowboat ashore and uh, say they wanted some water or some fresh meat and really they were spying. And, and I don't know whether you know the episode or not, but in New Glasgow, a little girl saw a boat coming from uh, uh, a boat, uh, a ship that stopped out in the lake. So she said the Rafinians were coming, and the alarm spread all the way through New Glasgow and the farmers. And uh, about a couple hours, they had 500 people in New <laughs> Glasgow ready to repel the raiders with pitchforks and old muskets and revolvers and blunderbusses and whatever they could lay their hands on. But uh, nothing happened. And many reported. Not many. There were several in the area of that. The one that you mentioned before where they took, where the Vienna went down, supposedly a hundred Fenian vessels merging on Port Stanley. And, of course, we had two companies go down, possibly a hundred men, either an extremely brave bunch or... Well, anyway, they came back and they were given a big volunteer welcome and a banquet in St. Thomas yes. and so on. Now, uh, the Vienna volunteers also... Uh, given a big banquet and reception when they got back to Vienna. Now, have you got a couple of pictures? Of yes, if you could show the first slide, please. We'll have to wait for a minute for our, uh, one of our cameras to pick this up. Vienna, a very active yes. community, uh, gave us uh, considerable military support. Yeah, this time. says, presentation edition, the already interesting program for the celebration of the 24th in Vienna. 
be highly interesting ceremony presenting a flag to the volunteer company by the ladies of Vienna. Right. And uh, that was, uh, they had a big volunteer dinner before that happened, too, the night they got back. Now, do you have a picture of the commander of that Vienna? Yes, uh, please, Miss Corporal Cook. Now, who's, what's this his This is name? Uh, who ended up captain, but was at time Lieutenant William Watts, W-A-T-T-S. Uh, he was the <laughs> company commander of the Vienna Infantry Company and served for a, quite a lengthy time after the Fenian invasions with the 25th Elgin Battalion. He's, he, this picture was taken about 1904. He is wearing, on the right-hand side, you can see his Fenian Raid medal. That's the Fenian Raid medal. Right, they weren't, we dated, we were, this helped us date it, because the Fenian Raid medals were not issued until 1900. It's that effect. Right, so. <laughs> Canada's always a little late. You know, right. in the War of 1812, they finally decided to reward the veterans. I think the date was something like 1872 yeah. that they finally got around to giving the veterans about $30 apiece for having fought in the War of 1812. So they got this medal out another 30-some years later, too. Eh? They were given a grant, a grant of land of 150 acres uh, up north, and way up north, but were required to um, homestead, that? homestead the area or clear it and uh, have someone up there at least. And most of them reverted back to the Crown. Uh, the, the General, However, there are some in St. Thomas, aren't there? The documents yes. granting the... Major Charlie Raven, yeah. uh, Raven Shustar. Uh, his grandfather oh, yeah. was a member of the St. Thomas uh, Rifle Company. And he received a grant of land. And uh, Major Raven has that document in his I think Mr. collection Clement, today. Uh, Mrs. Gordon Lemon has one. Has too. one, yes. I'm, I'm quite sure there must be a number. Now, of them. any other pictures of the Fenian times here? Uh, of the St. Thomas Volunteers? Or no, the Thomas we don't. Cavern? No, there are several in the book. There are uh, quite a few in the book. We have one of, of Madison Fisher here. I don't know whether you can actually. Perhaps uh, I wonder if one of the cameras could pick up Madison Fisher there. The St. Thomas, uh, we'll clear this up, the St. Thomas Troop of Cavalry at no time was part of the Elgin Regiment. In fact, it was a separate entity and was number one troop, uh, which eventually, number two troop being in London, eventually became the first Hussars, uh, an armored regiment who are still in existence today. They, they, they joined the first Hussars. Yes, they in fact really were the predecessors to the first Hussars. Well then, uh, I suppose as a result of uh, the Fenian invasions, um, the government decided to overhaul the militia. Yes. And then what happened in the fall of that? Yeah, in the fort on 14 September 1866, after the Militia Act, in fact, was revamped and the Militia Act came into being, the Elgin Regiment, the 25th Elgin Battalion of Infantry, came into existence. And this, this was the beginning of the Elgin Regiment, the one that we see today. 25th Battalion. Now, you have a, a hat there, Brian. I wonder if you'd model that for us. Uh -huh. Uh, <coughs> yeah. yeah, that so was the uh, and a, uh, a beautiful head badge there, that 25th uh, Battalion on. If anybody has an extra one, I wouldn't yeah. mind having one of those. Yeah, that's, that's an old militia here. pattern. It's it's circa the Fenian raids. Uh -huh. And this is the kind of helmet they'd wear. Right? Yes, exactly. In fact, in in the book, there are two or three photographs that, in fact, uh, uh, show that helmet. Well, then now let's give a, a brief history then of the 25th Battalion. 1866 on? Well, the 25th Battalion was made up originally of about eight companies in the area, three of which were in St. Thomas. There was a, a, a three-company battalion here. Uh, they changed almost annually in the area. Elmer was part of it, as I said, Vienna, Tilsonburg, Port Stanley. They all remained in existence for quite some time and until after the second Fenian invasion of 1870. Uh, the regiment itself progressed and expanded, and at that time was extremely active. Can I just say a word about 1870? That was the second Fenian invasion. It wasn't as bad as the 66 one. Not for this area, no. no. And uh, where did our troops go then? They were they called up for that? No. In fact, uh, the next slide that we have uh, shows this, and this particular one signed by or with a signature of W. Watts, the gentleman we just saw, they were called up 
but in fact that only took place locally. They were never called up on active service, and the only unit in the area to do so was the St. Thomas Troop of Cavalry. We were on ready, on standby, but of course nothing took place. So there was no need to call them into. Well, where did the cavalry go? Did they go down to Windsor again? Yes, they stayed in, in the roles that shows patrolling the Detroit River. Oh, yeah. And they patrolled that, and again along Lake Erie. Lake Erie shoreline was yeah. emphasized. Well, then, uh, uh, did they have, uh, did they have any camps, the 25th Battalion, like in the summertime? Did they have a... Yeah, oh, yes. After the organization of the militia took place in 66, there, in fact, were camps quarterly. Quarterly? Yes, at the time. And normally in the area, in the area of St. Thomas, in the flats at Lyndhurst. I think we'll see a picture of that shortly, to Port Stanley, um, and later on we'll see where they went to Alveston, Godrich, Tempsford. I see. Well, then they really uh, had a pretty quiet time in Canada. Also, though, in 1870, we had trouble, the real rebellion out west. Yes. And did not some members of the 25th Battalion volunteer? And yeah, there, there were about seven of them, seven. from what we can gather. Uh, one of the most noted, who in fact, as you know, sent uh, that, a letter that, back, yeah. William Allen Mann, M-A-N-N, who stayed in the area, out in the area, uh, went with Woolsey and the Red River Expedition and assisted uh, in the suppression of the First Real Rebellion. Again, they were supported in a minor way by the Fenians, so they all, were all tied in. Yes, yes. They, uh, I think they thought that Canada's attention on the West would help them here. Mm -hmm. well, let, then we go to 1885. That's the second rebellion in Western Canada when Riel came back from the States and started a rebellion in what's now Saskatchewan, right. the Battleford area. Do we have any of the 20th Battalion serving that? Yeah, the 25th. 25th, 25th yes. There was uh, three or four that we can detect. They went, the regiment didn't go as a whole. Um, the 7th Fusiliers, the 7th London Light Infantry from London, Ontario, were called up, and of course volunteers called for. And as I said, three or four members from the area went um, west away. Oh, yeah. um, a name probably known to many of the people who stayed on with the regiment and eventually went to the Boer War oh, I see. Uh, with the Canadian forces. Uh, that's the picture uh, of him. Coming. That's one of the ancestors, the Westways in St. Thomas now. Yes, I that's think. right. In fact, uh, listen, I just thought of something. You know, in 1866, when they called up the volunteers uh, for the Fenians, did, if you were a member of the volunteer rifles, could you get out of going when you were called up? Like, could you say, well, I'm sorry, I'm running a store and I haven't, you know, my help is sick and I won't be able to go? Or I don't really know. I don't, at the time, I don't know whether there's actually a law that you, in fact, had to serve, uh, but I do know that there was a lot of public pressure, pressure to go. Um, the people, when they went, and of course they were, most of them were clerks and farmers and whatever, not trained militiamen, when they were called to go, they literally did that. They went up and they went, and they went ill-provisioned, ill-equipped, and the Canadian militia, not specifically the Elgin Regiment, but the Canadian militia as a whole, did a lot of damage on their way to and from the front because they ran out of food and, and provisions, themselves. and of course they <laughs> helped themselves, yeah. exactly. What, what struck me as funny is when, when the St. Thomas Cavalry and the St. Thomas Volunteer Rifles were called up, uh, the Beaver Fire Department, yes, St. Thomas, right. volunteered to form another company to yeah, help a home Saint guard Thomas, or something. Guard. Yes. And then uh, a lot of the citizens of St. Thomas formed a home guard. And then the town council decided that uh, they voted $50 right away to buy the soldiers some, uh, you know, uh, cigars and right. things. But then they also decided to pay 50 cents a day to their families right. the fa of yes. the uh, non-commissioned officers and men because some of them, uh, when the husband was called away and he was working, right. he didn't get his salary. Yeah. <coughs> so the St. Thomas City Council voted the 50 cents, but the county council was a little stingier and they talked about it and talked about it and they laid it over for a while. And then finally they, they put the vote for 50 cents, but then there was a... Uh, they put the vote for 25 cents, and then there was an amendment by McKillop to make it 50 cents, but that amendment was defeated, so they eventually ended up paying them 25 cents to uh, the families, <laughs> uh, 25 cents per day to any of the families in the county. I, the militia always gets badly paid anyway yes. in wartime. 
Well, I suppose 50 cents a day in 1866. Uh, it really was. It was uh, sufficient, I would imagine. Yes. And plus that, uh, the, just the community itself would have lent in, and if anyone had been in trouble, and it's, yes. it's recorded in many instances. Well, now, I, I'm sorry to drag you back to 1866. No, We're up to 1885 with the 25th Battalion. And then from 1885 to 1900, uh, there are no wars, there's no agitation in Canada. And no, it was a typical time for the militia. They, they peak and they valley and they yeah. peak and they valley. And, and during that particular period was one of the few times when the, when the militia got both public and political support and they stayed fairly active. Uh, again, still some carryover from the, the British control of the area and that yep. at the time, or the, the pressure as far as the military yep. was concerned. Of course, Britain was very active at yep. that time in yep. her yep. building of the colonial. Well, then I suppose uh, the next big episode in the uh, regimental history or the military history of St. Thomas would be the Boer War, eh? Right. Or do you have, do you want to show a yeah, couple of slides here? We've got a good one. Uh, there's just one more here, I believe. This particular one, which is in backwards, is if you stand at the top where the Fena station is, as you're going westerly out of St. Thomas, and look into the flats, you will see the house that's in the upper center of the photograph is still there today, surrounded by pine trees. Uh -huh. The actual sloping topography there is still there, but of course the crick, uh, Kettle yes. Creek was rerouted and brought closer to the bottom of the hill. But yeah. where they camped for many, many years uh, in that area, um, that we feel is probably about 1885, 1890. 18 that's courtesy of the Pioneer Museum, by the way, too. Uh, that photo. Well, that's one of the Cameron collection. Uh, yes, uh, it he is. Gave that's to right. The, uh, uh, Colonel Cameron, who was quite a military interest himself, yes. wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. So that's in the Lynnhurst Flats. Are right. there any other pictures of this time of the annual camps, or no, not of this particular no. period? In no. fact, they're very. From what we've been able to find, they're very few and far between, unfortunately. I, I think we should remind any of our viewers that uh, related to Caswell or D.G. McKenzie or some of these people who were commanders of the St. Thomas Volunteer Rifles and the Cavalry, we'd love to have pictures of them. Oh, yeah, very much so. If anyone does have, we emphasize now we do not want the originals. We don't no, no. want any family heirlooms, but we would be, we're more than prepared and we're set up to make copies. copies and. Up, yeah. So if any of you, are, uh, Caswell is one that interests me. I'd like to get his. And then, <clears throat> uh, just an example of how difficult it is to find pictures of uh, some of these early military men. Uh, the regiment had a very difficult time finding a picture of Lieutenant Colonel Macbeth. Yes. Who uh, was a man who inherited all of Talbot's money, or most of it, and uh, who was the first Lieutenant Colonel of the 25th Battalion. And it's with the assistance of, in this case, like yourself and uh, Major Chamberlain, Bob Chamberlain, uh, it's without the assistance outside of local historians and just general interest people that we will never well, be John, able to complete John our... Carr at Phelps yes. and that, and Ed Phelps at West, and <laughs> yeah. finally a picture of him turned up, but not in military uniform. No, unfortunately is, no, uh, but... Too bad. No. So that, uh, if you have any... Uh, uh, relatives and especially photos with dates on. If you get in touch with Brian, he'd be glad to have. Well, I think we better go up to the Boer War. Okay. Mm. The, this, sorry, we'll, this is a group of officers, uh, circa 1890 of the 25th. This is unfortunately a, a poor print. This particular photograph is in the book, but it's in much better quality. Colonel Lindsay, we've identified almost all of the officers. But Colonel Lindsay uh, is the officer seated in the in the center. Center. Were well, his legs crossed? Yes. Yes. And he's the one that served in the volunteers, did he not? Yes, he in did. The 1866, yes, he, he and then an uh, eventually became commander. Yeah. Right. Many of the commanding officers came up through the ranks yeah. at that through that at that particular time. If we could I have the next slide, please. Again, another group of officers. Uh, of a slightly earlier period, you can see a variation in dress also uh, at that particular time. The standardization of militia dress was slowly taking place. And in the 80s was the first time that, in fact, in local militia units, that they, there was an actual 
set rules or address regulations laid down for It was militia. kind of more interesting, really, because they could uh, design their own uniforms, couldn't they, and their own colors very often, like in the St. Cases, Thomas yeah. Volunteers. And uh, you read articles in the papers about the new uniforms having arrived and, you know, right. gold lacing here and yellow stripes and all this kind of thing. But uh, this is why they vary, is it? Because uh, you just sort of roughly conform to a... That's uh, it exactly. Roughly conform is ex exactly what... They look like Russians, you know, with those hats somehow. I don't know why. They're a form of peaked Pe pillbox. I see, pillbox yeah. hat. Which okay. were in, in use till about 1900. Yeah. If we could have the next, we'll eventually yeah. get to the Boer War. Yeah. Oh, no. this is a band. The Which band? band? This is the 25th Battalion The 25th Battalion Band, Battalion band yes. Um, what date's that picture? It's 1893, I believe. Uh -huh. And fortunately, um, Lieutenant Colonel W.A. Andrews, uh, now deceased, a former commanding officer of the regiment, was, besides being a, an avid local historian, a former adjutant, which made him a pack rat. Uh, he kept everything, and it was, it's because of the few people like him that we have any form of history whatsoever. And he has had this photograph with every name, and oh, it, it is in the book, and it's, it's nice to have the names with yeah. besides just the photograph. That's a pretty fair-sized band, isn't it? Yes, it was. You know, the, everybody had a band, didn't they? The St. Thomas Cavalry had a band. Yes, they had a mounted band yeah. for and a time. And St. Thomas had a brass band, and Elmer had a brass band, the United Indian Reserve had a brass right. band, and, uh, and then generally the public had to, in St. Thomas, were always taking subscriptions to buy the band instruments. Right. Oh, have any other pictures now of the 25th Battalion? Well, we'll see what, okay, now we're into the Boer War. This is the this Boer the, War. Finally into the Boer War, yes. Well, we better just say a few words, Brian, about the Boer War. Uh. <clears throat> okay. Um, the Boer War the, basically was a colonial war. Uh, it did not directly involve Canada initially. Britain was attempting to obtain control of the southern African states at that particular time, Orange Free State and Natal. Yeah. Rhodesia, they discovered diamonds and gold that got too valuable to leave to the Africaners. That's right. what uh, it was, perhaps. Yeah. And the original settlers of the area, the Boers, the, the Dutch, and yeah. of course they objected strongly, and unfortunately the outbreak of the Boer War. Yeah. And that war that Britain thought it'd only take them a few months to defeat a few Dutch farmers, eh? Yes. Uh, but those Dutch farmers were expert in guerrilla warfare and. and uh, extremely fine marksmen. Yes. And they. The Britain, as you mentioned, they felt it was only going to last a short time. They struck a medal, and on the back of it, they put the date 1899-1900. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, they had to call back tens of thousands and have that date erased. To change to 192. Right. Yeah. One of the only units who obtained that medal, the original, was the Lord Strathcona Horse. Of course, uh, organized. Are, those, are some of those medals still in existence? Yes, they are still in existence, highly prized by collectors. Uh, and the unit went over in 1899. It was back in six months. That was the, the one that was raised by uh, Donald Smith, Lord Strathcona, yes, Lord Strathcona. And he outfitted them all, paid expense. their wages, and sent them to Africa. Exactly. And uh, that, uh, that is now an armored regiment and is still in existence. Yes, in Calgary. Uh, it's a main armored training center uh, for Canadian militia. I was out there this summer Were you? with them. Well, now, these are all St. Thomas men who volunteered for the Boer War, I think. Right. We. We had approximately 18, from what we've gathered now, we're slowly adding, from Elgin County, who served in the Boer War. Uh, these, this particular group uh, covers many units. Now, again, the Elgin Regiment did not go over and attack, were not called to. Uh, the, there was a, the second Special Service Battalion of the RCR was formed, and many of the members went with that the Royal Canadian Horse Artillery, Canadian Field Artillery, and the Canadian Mounted Rifles, um, all of which were represented by members of the Elgin Regiment. Oh, I see. In this particular photograph, the gentleman in the upper center is Westaway. That's the one that was out in the 1885. The, right, the, right, in, within the first, in the second riel. Uh, number the, in the center to the right is Ermatinger. That's Percy Ermatinger. Percy Ermatinger. Uh, Major. His wife is still alive. Yes, she is. B. Azardi. Uh, yes. Yeah. And I've met with her and spoke with her several times, and she's 
um, provided considerable assistance, and the family, the Zardi family, has been very helpful. Um, at that time, he was a, a constable uh, in the Northwest Mounted Police from 98 to 99, uh, was given special leave, enlisted with the Canadian Mounted Rifles, went to the Boer War, uh, served there, was taken a prisoner of war, and he left a diary. And in the diary, he gives several statements which are backed up by official records that he told the Boers either uh, he had had enough of traveling along to either kill him or let me go. And the Boers, uh, uh, un unlike the propaganda at the time, were human beings and they, they let him go. They, they let him go. I never heard that story. Yeah, before. and he eventually got back and he was commissioned as an officer. He uh, was given the rank of lieutenant for his service in the Boer War and stayed on there until 1906. Didn't he stay on with the South African Constabulary? Yes. No. He stayed. Here's a picture of him with E Division. He was the division commander at that time. He's in the center with the... That peaked hat? Yes, with the yeah, peaked hat. That's Percy Ermatinger. That's Percy Ermatinger. And with some of his staff from E Division of the South African Constabulary. And he stayed on there and received both the Queen's and King Edward's medal for service in South Africa in the Boer War. Well, then he came back and married. Uh, but then I, I, he also volunteered for the Second World War. Did he go? No, he... I guess he must have... The not, First War, you mean? The uh, First uh, World War. Yes, he went overseas he in did. the First World War, and he received the appropriate... He went over early. He received yeah. the 1415 star and uh, retired with the ma rank of major. And he was with the Canadian Army Service Corps. Be a, because of his and, age. And uh, that Percy Ermatinger is the uh, son of uh, Judge C. O. Ermatinger, who yes. was the son of Edward Ermatinger, yes. uh, who was the son of Lawrence Ermatinger, who was a commissary general in the uh, Napoleonic Wars. Right. And in yeah. the diary, he makes reference to an auntie. And this particular auntie was a daughter of Judge Richardson, who in fact was a judge who tried Louis Riel. Oh, at the Tosh. So there's... And then, I don't know what that amp is. I don't know that relationship. Well, that's interesting, that picture. We can have... I believe there's two... That's, again, uh, Lieutenant Ermatinger as a, as a constable in his mounted police yeah. cap with his buffalo skin and the uh, coat. Uh, we can have the next one. And again, as a very distinguished, gallant-looking officer in the South African Constabulary. Now, <laughs> now an officer, now a lieutenant. Oh, you got we certainly covered Percy Ermatinger, right? Who else from St. Thomas went to South Africa? We had W. J. Green, yeah. who eventually became commanding officer and took the regiment overseas in the First World War. There was Sutherland. Yeah. There was an Anderson. Stanbury, and of course an Anderson, yes, who's the uncle of Don Anderson, yeah. of Anderson's here in town. And uh, he was uh he was uh he really picked up something there, didn't he? I, I think he died. Uh, no, that was Edge Farley. Yeah, but Anderson also died very young. He died a few years after he came back, didn't he? I think from... I, know, I don't know, George. Really... Yes, I, I, uh, I think it was because of his experiences in South Africa. Yeah. But Farley, Edge Farley, was died of fever there. Yes, in the Orange Free State uh, colony yeah. at that time. Now, uh, and then Stacy, have you mentioned him? Stacy, yes, and there was Barrett, uh, Tiger Barrett, uh, still a very active member of the regiment and the trumpeter for the 91st and a member of the Elgin Regiment. He's still alive? Tiger Barrett. No, this is Tiger, his yeah. uh, grandson. Yeah. Of course, grandson he's, he's of, of yes. that Barrett, yes. I see. Yeah. He's still very active uh, and, of course, yeah. come up through Kaus. Yeah. Uh, now, McKenzie. both Green and Stacy kept diaries, didn't they? Of, uh, Stanbury? Uh, Stanbury, I yes. guess. Yes. Stanbury kept we're, we're very fortunate. Uh, uh, Stanbury and, and Green oh. and Ermatinger yeah. all yeah. kept very good oh. diaries. A lot of interesting facts that some cases you don't find in Canadian history. Well, books. yes, I think the Green diary points out the mutiny yes. that occurred in the uh, British forces uh, right. among the Canadians anyway who said, uh, you know, we want to go home and our time's up and you haven't right. treated us right. And right. This is all soft-pedaled in the history right. books. Uh, Backed up by many other diaries, yes. not of the area, and also to a degree, they were kept. Uh, they, of course, they, 
they traveled over, I, I forget the name of the ship right now, but they once by the time they got overseas, they were kept on board at Cape Town. Again, these are, are militiamen, but not regular force, not super trained. They're just the average guy. And when you take him out of a community like St. Thomas, put him on a boat, send him across the ocean, and then, you know, eventually nerves. Well, I get think to they got edge. kind of tired of English officers in that <laughs> class distinction, and uh, because they were all prominent men in their own community here, yes. they were all volunteers that yes. uh, they wanted to serve Queen Victoria. And, uh, like Green and uh, several of the of the officers from the regiment yes. relinquished their commissions and, and uh, went over as privates. Private, they yeah. wanted to serve that badly. Yeah, and they were really very patriotic men. Well, now listen, we got. Uh, I, I don't know how much time we have here, but we're always running. What time have you got there? I've got 10 to 9. Right? Oh, we've got to get going. Now, okay. what about the, we still haven't got the Elgin Regiment. We're the 25th Battalion. Right, which is the Elgin Regiment. That's yes, a, a designation but I mean, now at the time. It, uh, when does the Elgin Regiment start? Well, the, the Elgins as such really come into being with that designation at the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Okay. They the were, Second World right. War. They were called the Elgin right. Regiment. The 91st Battalion, the First World War Battalion, are the 91st. Yeah. They are Elgin Regiment people, but they also are the 91st. Yeah. And a very distinguished but completely separate organization apart. But it was just built up as a result of the First World War. Yes, it was made up of all the members of the active regiment at the time. Yeah. It was a reserve battalion established here. Um, we called out approximately 940 all ranks, 33 officers went. I think, Brian, if we have 10 minutes left, and you have a lot of interesting slides, perhaps we'll just go along and show right. some of these slides, okay. and then you can make comments on them. We're, okay, this, this is a group, this is the first group that left St. Thomas with... Um, this for West, the second, First World War? No, I'm sorry, we're, we're still at the Boer War. Still at the we'll Boer go War, We'll very right. quickly here. The bottom right is um, West Away. And the gentleman standing upper, second from the left, is Edge Farley. He's oh, yeah. the he chap who died, died there, yeah. overseas. Okay, if we can change. Officers, 1909, Alveston, one of the camps that they used to go to. This, uh, um, most of the names, all of these are named. They're all in the book. And the names would probably be prominent to most people. Next slide, please. The band, again, at Alveston. Okay. Dr. John D. Curtis, Sr. Yes, now he, uh, he's rather an important man. I'm going to talk about him for a minute. Uh, uh, he, he wrote some memoirs also about being a school teacher and a doctor, and he was one of the most prominent doctors in St. Thomas. And he went over and served as a doctor in England yes. uh, during the war, and then he right. came back, and he was the first... Uh, uh, president of the Legion here. Oh, is that right? Oh, yes. They uh, they asked him, a yeah. group of people asked him to help in forming the uh, St. Thomas Legion. Right. At that and time, it was the British Empire yes, I League, think it I believe. Called it was called Legion, right. That's right. But, yeah. uh, <coughs> he was the first uh, president or chairman or whatever you right. I think president uh, of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a very long military career. He was also on the city council. He was responsible for getting the Memorial Hospital built and uh, uh, made a lot of improvements in sanitation and so on in St. Thomas. And uh, uh, he was one of the men who started the first golf course here. So he, quite, a, quite a man. I've never seen that picture of him. That's when he was uh, called a lieutenant surgeon. Surgeon, yes. Uh -huh. he, th that particular photograph, I believe, uh, is when... I think it's from 1913. It's from one of the local newspapers, as you can see on the right-hand side there. It's just photographed right from there. There were many of the officers photographed. And the 10th Battalion, the Royal Grenadiers, were in town that particular day for a celebration of it. And that, that's where that, that's, I think, circa, about circa 1910, 1913. No. Uh, well, the Reverend Cannon Hill. Yes, eventually Archdeacon Hill who stayed, who was with the regiment. He was the regimental chaplain or padre for This is the decades. Elgin Regiment. Yes, literally yeah. decades. Uh, I believe he was the, the minister at uh, Trinity, uh, because, of course, Trinity being the regimental church at the time. Did he go the, overseas with them? No, he didn't. He didn't. In fact, 
the medal that he is wearing there is a Fenian Raid medal. Oh, is he? We'd be, yes. He'd be old enough for the Fenian Raids. He'd be too old for... But when the regiment was called up, and uh -huh. we'll see a picture here shortly, yeah. in 15, he yeah. was still on active active service at the time. So the medal he's wearing is a medal won in 1866. Six, and right. this picture is taken in 19... 10, 13, 13 19, somewhere 10, in that period, there. yes. And he was the uh, longest serving chaplain then of the Oh, elders. yes, yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Next. The Duke of Connaught visited the city, I believe laid the cornerstone for the Uh-oh. Y. That's right. Yeah. And uh, there were many interesting activities took place that day. He's inspecting a guard of honor. Is this uh, from the Elgin Regiment? This is the Elgin Regiment. With, with these fancy hats? Uh, it's, that's a different type. It's a, it's a lobster tail type, but again, a pith helmet. You can see the officer at the forefront here, to the right, wearing a helmet plate, similar to this particular one here. Do you know what that officer at the front? The, na the names are on them. I can't tell no, you right no, now, George, but we do have, we were able to identify them because many of the photographs are very good. This particular one is from a postcard. Is it? Many of the local postcard collectors uh, mm. will find that there's numerous pictures of the regiment. Mm. Uh, uh, postcard. Yeah, a, a lot of them. I'd, I'd say dozens and dozens, really, that I've seen. Where were they inspecting the regiment there? What, can you tell me what that building is in the background? No, we can't. We haven't been able to identify it. We, I, we, we're not really sure where that is. It must be down around a Horton Market or someplace. I would think so. It must be very close to uptown because of where the ceremonies were all virtually took place yep. at the same time. What year was that when the Duke Connaught started the YMCA or laid the cornerstone? Thirteen. 1913. Can I have the next? For the Quebec Terre Centenary, 1908, oh, the yeah. 25th Regiment, as they are now known, the word Elgin, in fact, is not in there. Well, that, uh, is that the contingent that went down to Quebec? Yes, that's the company that went. Yeah. That was I a see. composite company they, of all of the various companies. Some people won't remember that, but 1608 was when Champlain built Quebec, and then 1908 was the 300th anniversary. Eh? Yes. And uh, so they went down to Quebec, and that delegation went down representing the uh, Elgin Regiment. Right. Again, you can see them wearing the, the uniform of the time. Or is that like taken against an armory wall? Yes, that's taken against the front of the present armories, oh, which was that. built in 03, 1903. Yeah. This is a group of the officers. We think is circa 1911. We haven't been able to identify it. But some of the officers in the back row standing, uh, immediate left is uh, Captain Medcalf. Colonel Medcalf's father. The third man over is from Chet the Smith. Right or the left? From the left, I'm sorry, is Chet Smith. Oh, yeah. The fourth is Colonel Green. Uh -huh. uh, this, see, I assume, is some kind of regimental picnic or do or. It was an exercise that the regiment was involved in a training weekend. See. that the regiment was involved in. Of course, the officers had all their, their wives and that came up for a day. Oh, I see. In the, uh, the immediate right seated is uh, Lieutenant Ponsford, and in the center with his arms folded is a Major Madden, and again, Re Reverend or Archdeacon Hill. And seated in there, and I can't identify them right now, but Colonel Medcalf is Eric in Medcalf's there. Medcalf's in there. Yes, <laughs> and... Uh, He's probably up to mischief. He's in that picture. Yeah. Ike was a hellion when he was a kid. <laughs> no comment. No. And well, you know, as Colonel a, and Wing Commander Green, oh, J. Yeah. Fred Green, uh, won the DSC in the Second World War, is in there. See, the maddening thing with pictures like that is that people who have, at the time they were taken, never put the names yeah. down. Eh? And I've been back to most of the families, yeah. and they even have difficulty. No, it's, it's hard to uh, identify now. But luckily, we're, we're slowly filling most yeah. of the gaps. Well, we still haven't got to the war here. This is... Uh, Again, the band, if we can... That's not a very good one. Uh, the band, uh, we feel this is about 1912, 1913. Uh -huh. Wilson Ave Bridge, when it was steel. Oh, yeah. That would help us date it. You can see the, yes. the uh, railway, uh -huh. the street railway, yeah. on its way to Pinafore Park, yeah. and the old alignment of the bridge. Goddard's Camp. Again, the band, a postcard 
That's another postcard. 1912. Yeah. Right. This came from Mr. Rowe on Sunset Drive. Oh, yeah. Who both him and his father were in the, the band for, oh, for decades. Uh, very active supporters of the regiment. Now, the war. This is the 91st? No, this is the first, this is the contingent that went with the 1st Battalion. On the 22nd of August in 1914, right at the very start, 100 men exactly, one officer and 99 other ranks, left St. Thomas on that day and moved across Canada through Valcartier and eventually went overseas. There were approximately 60 members, 65 members of the regiment joined up immediately. And the officer, I don't know whether you can see it in this particular case, on the right is Lieutenant Met, M-E-T-C-L-F-E, calf, who was killed overseas. Oh, yeah. He was the officer in command of the St. Thomas contingent. Okay. Fenian yeah. raid veterans. So those are the first front. volunteers leaving St. Thomas right. in 1914. In 14 August. Yeah. August 1914. Again, the band leading them out of town, down Talbot Street. Again. Four members, families. This was typical of what happened in St. Thomas in the 91st Battalion. This particular photograph is of uh, Provo Corporal Col uh, Robinson, Robertson, who uh, both his steps, his son, and, and two stepsons uh, went overseas. He got as far. You can see the age of the gentleman there. He yeah. got to England. Uh, the whole family went over. The whole male family went over, and the gentleman on the left and the right were both killed. Two one, out of four. Yes, no. one at Canal du Nord and uh, one at, uh, at Vimy in December after the main. The center photograph is my wife's grandfather. Hey. The, the man with the mustache? <laughs> the, yes. No, the gentleman in the right of that. Ah, I see. That's your wife's grandfather. His, his Anne's wow, grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can have the Colonel Green in the center with the X, Archdeacon Hill to the left, and Major Madden at camp in 1915. I see. Now you can see this summer. Where's this camp? It's just outside the city outside at the city. time, yeah, in the flats. They were in, just after they had been required to mobilize. Yep. He had received orders to mobilize a battalion of infantry. These are some of the NCOs from C Company of the 91st. Um, and these are all identified in the book. These are yes. all photographs that are from the book. Yeah. Right. The gentleman standing left, Don, Don Stokes, alderman. Oh, yeah. Former that mayor. Father? Yeah. William Stokes uh -huh. is there. Yeah. Uh, the second from the right is uh, Mr. Palmerston. Oh, yeah. Roy Palmerston, uh, yeah. a former um, Boer War vet. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, this is when the Elgin Regiment. Yes, this is when the 91st. The 91st, I right. mean, yeah. This was the last church parade prior to them leaving for overseas in the 22nd of June, 1916. Look at that mixture of horse and... Can we see have that yeah. back again for a minute? Picture of horse and buggy and the cars. Right. And, uh, that is, is... Take the AMP parking lot and the building away, and that's where they are right now. Oh, I see. That's, that's the Michigan Central Michigan Station. Central Station, yeah. uh, Conrail. Colonel Green who commanded the regiment, formed the regiment, and took them overseas. This is Mel on the left, uh, and Corporal Charlie Baldwin. Oh, yes. And Charlie, who uh, lives on Pine Street, yeah. is the very active 91st member. He's the secretary treasurer uh, and a good friend. Charlie, uh, Sir Dorsey, was wounded four times. Was he really? Overseas, <laughs> right. And his, his uh, cousin, uh, Unfortunately, he died just recently, won the military medal for bravery for his service overseas. Now, this is the 91st on there. This is the 91st in the fall of 1915. This was a, a recruiting parade. Yeah, they're not marching to the station, are they? No, they're not. They're, they're marching heading uh, westerly this westerly, time. Westerly, yeah. Uh, with their winter yeah. kit, field kit on. This is, was titled The Last Nominal Roll. This was taken just behind the regiment at the broom factory, Victor oh, Gasket, yeah. where they were barracked, and just prior to them going overseas, oh. marching down Talbot Street. Okay, if we can have the next one. This is... Uh, the 91st on their way to the Talbot. Train. Right, next. Again, the same under Lieutenant Stevens, the machine gun company. This and is boarding the, the train. 
My goodness. You know, I, I think the last time we showed that picture, is, there's a picture of a, somebody reaching up and kissing, a, holding a baby up yeah. to be kissed, and the woman phoned us up who was that me. baby. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, it yeah. says St. Thomas a, to Berlin. How many of that 91st, how many casualties did they suffer? Uh, one of every six men one who left them. that day. There were five officers. And one of every six men who left that day were killed. Stayed there, that's right. And that's not counting numbers like Baldwin who were wounded. And so oh, on, you know. and I would say another 50% of them yeah. were casualties of some sort. This photograph was supplied by uh, Company Sergeant Major Art Freeman, lives on St. George Street, a 91st member. Uh, that was taken, I believe, in the uh, Passchendaele near pa after the... That mud battle, terrible, yes. I think. It's yeah. typical, and yeah. tanks, I believe, were first used next. That's another scene of the desolation of Typical. Western Flanders. And... Right. Now, we're into the period between the wars. Yes. Uh, this is uh, R.W. Johnson, and it was captain, paymaster at the time, and, and Balkwell, Captain Balkwell. Uh -huh. That's a very, unfortunately, poor one. But the regiment in the 30s won the Canadian Militia Efficiency Cup, which was the trophy at the time. and. Uh, Colonel Stacy there, Stanbury, excuse me. Interesting photograph. This came from the Andrews collection. On the extreme left is Lieutenant John Andrews, son of Colonel Andrews, who commanded, this particular chap commanded the Calgary tank and was killed at the Dieppe raid. He oh, commanded yes. the Calgary's at the, at the landing at Dieppe. Uh, Bear Lewis on the right. Oh, he's in the far right? The extreme down. right. Uh, he was head of the... St. Thomas Collegiate Cadet Corps yes, for, for years. Yes, for many, many years. Football coach. Uh, to the second from the right, or the left seated, is A.K. Mayer. He was second in command of the regiment, Second World War. Next. The presentation of the colors to the first Elgins. It took place in Pinafore Park. Again, just prior, after the presentation and prior to the departure. What year is that? 1935. 1935. This is at camp. In 38, at Pine Hill, which is in the London area, the gentleman to the right of the minister is uh, Charlie Raven. Oh, yeah. And the gentleman to his left is Charlie Cook. <laughs> so, and the others are all identified. They're both merchants in town. Next week, yes. Yeah. The officers of the 1935 period. Yeah. Next, please. The depositing of the colors just prior to the war in 1941. Yeah. Uh, Brian, I think we're going to have to uh, wind this program up. I'd just like to remind the viewers that all the pictures you uh, have been watching are being published in a book called The Elgins that will be published approximately the 1st of December, we hope. And you can phone either Brian, Lieutenant Brian Sim and order one, or you can phone the orderly room at the Elgin Regiment and order one if you're interested in. Now, Brian, I'd like to thank you very much for all the time and effort you put in in amassing this set of slides and letting us pick your brain with all the information. You certainly are the most prominent military historian in St. Thomas. So. <coughs> thank um, you, George. I, I appreciate and, uh, that, and I'd like everybody to know that if it wasn't for people like George, specifically George, a lot of us wouldn't be as active well, as we, we are. We better cut so. that out because that's not quite true. Yeah. Uh, well, well uh, this program will be shown tomorrow at 2 p.m. and I think shown again on Friday. And uh, I'll be on again the second Wednesday in October. And I hope to see you then. Thank you very much for watching. Good night. Thank you, George.